everybody to today's workshop session, Results Now, using digital growth strategies, applying modern digital market techniques to get more customers. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's speakers. We have two speakers today, Rita busher Kulis and Peter Histroff of Acronis. Rita is a digital senior, the digital media manager at Acronis. She's responsible for overseeing the company's global paid digital marketing efforts. She brings a passion for creating connections and telling stories through digital and traditional marketing tactics. She brings almost two decades of leadership and marketing management. And Peter is a senior SEO manager at Acronis, bringing over seven years of experience in digital marketing, primarily in SEO. He started his, his SEO journey at a Bulgarian agency back in 2015. Two years later, Peter created his own local-based SEO agency that was tailored to B2B clients. His passion is creating in-depth SEO content strategies for websites that satisfy user experience and bring in results to the clients. So take it away, please. Read in, Peter. Give him a hand. We get hype music. <laughs> Hello, Peter. Welcome to the third day of the summit. Hope you're enjoying yourself. So we did a little bit of a joke with uh, some of the hype music coming into it because we know that for a lot of people, marketing can feel like it's uh, this really big deal or this really scary thing. So we're going to take a minute to just kind of do a rapid fire, introduce everybody in the room, and just hand raise. Nothing super, super uh, complicated here. But so that we know and we can really tailor the discussion. How many people in this room are a marketer by profession? Okay, excellent, welcome. And how many of you, are any of you business owners? Okay, so then it looks like we have a couple others in the room as well. Are you, for the people who are in the room, neither a business owner or a marketer, is marketing kind of one of the, the many hats you wear? Okay, I've been there. I've been there too. <laughs> All right, just to help level set, because we do have, with an SEO expert here, uh, please raise your hand if you have a website. Okay. Nice. Perfect. So we're going to tailor a few different things that you can do with your website to help bring in more leads, but also to make sure that you're really being represented well in the search engine so that you're higher ranks without having to necessarily invest the same funds. And do any of you have a documented marketing plan? So not back of napkin, like this is actually what we're doing? Okay. And for those of you who do, do you have a budget that you use as well? Like a set budget? Okay. It's grown exponentially. Hey, that's nice. what we like to hear. Okay, so hopefully we're going to get all of you to the same place. So when you come back next year, you'll say, hey, reader, hey, Peter, we saw you, and now we have a higher budget. We're doing more of this work. Okay, so social media, how many people are using social media to promote your company? Okay. Um, and then anyone doing paid media at all? Advertising? Okay couple of you. We'll talk about that. And for those of you who are not currently using paid media, we'll talk about some of the ways that you can get into it, how to do it in you know not so scary a way, and also a budget-friendly way, because if you have no budget to prove the value, it kind of becomes a little difficult. In this, we're going to try to scale the discussion to the group. If you sat down in a space and you don't have a worksheet in front of you, there's a couple on this table right in front of me. So what we intend here is there'll be some slides that will have action for you to actually write down. Um, some where we'll raise our hands just to get a, a pulse on what's going on in the room. And the idea is that you'll have this. You can take it home, fill it in later. Uh, a lot of it is geared towards a content marketing strategy. And then we'll talk about how you can use digital media to execute that. Uh, you won't fill everything in here. It's, in, it's intended to be a take-home tool that you can replicate multiple ways. So we're going to go through just to level set digital marketing. So what are we talking about that here? We're talking about every platform from your website to websites you may publish on. Uh, it could be your CRM. It could be your email system. We're talking about tactics like search engine optimization, paid media, uh, social media marketing, email marketing. It's a lot for us to cover in an hour. So I want to just stop and say, if you have a question, you know, raise your hand. Let's talk about it in real time. If we don't, 
uh, get through everything or everything in depth. We want this to be really valuable for you. So let us know in real time. Don't worry about waiting till the end. And then for digital marketing, big goals that people have, they're either using it for branding, um, sometimes it's a combination of these lead gen, so either new leads or nurturing the leads that you already have and then ultimately getting to a point of customer consumption. So you have people who are already working with you, how do you get them to further engage and consume more of the things that you're working? So you become, you might have heard the phrase, you become really sticky to them. You're as much a part of their business as they are of yours. So we're gonna start with establishing goals. If you look on your worksheet, there'll be a section where you can just kind of write this down. There are, we have six major goals that a lot of people use for digital marketing. So one is to grow their revenue. One is to establish thought leadership. And if you wanna put your hand up real quick and say like, this is what I'm focused on, we'll try to tailor the conversation to make sure we fit your needs. Some are just looking to build their brand and establish themselves in the marketplace. Attracting new clients, okay. So brand clients so far are winning. Some are increasing marketing efficiency. So you may already have a marketing program, but you wanna make sure that you're using your dollars in a more efficient way. And this next one, I won't make any of you raise your hand, but maybe you wanna attract new investors and you're looking for somebody to purchase your company eventually. We're gonna talk about executing your digital plan. So step one was making sure you have those goals. So you'll see on your worksheet, you can put down which of those six maybe are something you wanna focus on. Before we can do anything else, we need to know who are we talking to. So those of you in marketing, you've heard of this as personas, you've probably already got these developed. Those of you who maybe have not created these plans, the easiest way to think of your personas is to think of your customers. Who are you talking to the most? Are you speaking to a business owner with no IT experience? Are you maybe working more with someone who's actually signing the legal documents or the financial approval? So like Finance Fred? Or are you working with somebody who has IT experience? We'll, we'll call her IT Irene here. And IT Irene may be a one person who's doing everything in the, in the company from IT. It may be a small team that just doesn't have the experience or the depth that your business can offer them. So they're asking you to come in and supplement an existing team. For this discussion, we're going to go through one persona and just give you examples so you can actually see what this would look like in real life and we can work through it. And we'll go with IT Irene. So for this, we'll talk a little bit about overall content marketing strategies. So those of you who have a marketing program, would you consider that you have a content marketing strategy very specific that you introduced through? Okay, wonderful. So we may, we might kind of talk about that and have a couple examples to share if you're if you're comfortable. So in the worksheet, you'll see that there's a section for you to write down your audience's interests and concerns. How do you figure out what your audience cares about? Well, what do they come to you? What are the products you sell the most? What are the questions your technicians are answering or the tickets that they're doing the most? Those are common things that you can use to help build your business. Then we think about, on the opposite side of the table, what is the expertise of your team? So what are the things they're nerding out about when they're not on call? What are the things they get really excited when they're doing? You don't have to do it all now, but think about those and write those two in the different columns and then actually you know, use lines to cross and see where the connections are. Where the connection is, is the easiest place for you to probably start your content marketing because there's a business need and there's a passion and a knowledge base in your company. We'll talk a little bit more about how we take those categorizations. We turn them into really great website SEO and a full content strategy to work with. We'll talk about, there's a space on your worksheet you can document if you already have an existing asset, like a blog post or a white paper. And we'll talk about some of the different platforms you can use and a few prompts to help you start writing because that's one of the things I hear the most from people when they're not marketing professionals is, you know, I'm not, a market, I'm not a writing expert. I don't know how to do this. How do I even figure out what to write about? So we'll have a couple prompts to help make that a little easier for you. Thank you, Rita. You're welcome. Right, so everything that just Rita talked about would not be possible if we don't have a structured keyword research. 
So as she mentioned, let's take Irene from the previous slide. And we did say a couple of times that she probably has a cybersecurity background. So in order to create that structured keyword research, initially you need to begin with one category. In this case, it would be cybersecurity. So as soon as you have your main category, you want to start looking for relatively, relative keywords. Now, they could be cybersecurity software, cybersecurity services, solutions, definition of cybersecurity, and so on. After you have all your keywords for your main category, you want to start digging deeper, a level down, into your subcategories. So when we talk about cybersecurity, we have cyber threats, we have network security, cloud security, and endpoint security. Once you get those keywords for these subcategories, then you go even another level down. So you start, for example, let's, let's look at cyber threats. You can talk about ransomware, you can talk about adware, spyware, you get the point. So at this point, you probably have a complete keyword research or close enough to a complete one. So now you need to start creating content. And the way you do that is you pick a category from your list initial single category that you're going to work with. Now, once you do that, you need to choose your approach. Do you want to inform the, the people who are going to read that content? Do you want to talk about a trending topic or maybe just answer a commonly asked customer question? Then you have to choose the platform where you want to share it. Is it going to be on your blog section, website, um, you know, YouTube channel, or social media, which Rita is about to talk about in a second? Uh, and afterwards, of course, in order to make it work, you need to optimize. So as we mentioned already, you need to primarily focus on informational intent topics. So these are topics that usually are defining your main category. Um, what the category is about, why is it important, um, anything that can be informational to the user who, already, who doesn't know anything about it already. Um, then write as much as possible. Do not limit yourself to a certain word count. Now, don't be one of the people who uh, look at a certain content and say, okay, this is 2,000 words. I think that's enough. No, just write as much as possible. Make sure you're covering the entire topic. Do not worry about the word count. Stick to only one main topic. Um, make sure you don't sell pizzas and sneakers on the same page. Uh, you have to stick to the main topic. Uh, choose either one and write for the user and not for the search engine. So, um, you know, we are not in the 90s anymore. Search engines are actually smart enough to be able to rank your website for keyword cluster topics rather than a single keyword. So don't focus on one keyword and spam it all over your page. Make it look natural. Um, always connect your content to your product or service or solution. So whenever the user lands on your page, make sure that they have a place where they should convert. And uh, I think this is a really good example of a content outline, what we just talked about, uh, how it should be structured. On top, you have the definition of what is cybersecurity. Then the subtopic is importance, importance of cybersecurity. Some details could be benefits of cybersecurity challenges of cybersecurity, and then just rinse and repeat all the way down. Now, always you should be closing your content with your product solution. Could be a service or software. Always make sure that's towards the end and that will give a place for the person to convert. Now, uh, there's some uh, details about how often to share, which Rita's gonna go over them. Thank you. So. We've gone through structure for SEO. What does this mean, and how does this actually result in you getting leads? So first thing you need to know is if you're not being seen, you can't convince someone to become a lead, right? So you have to be showing in these search engines. Peter's going to explain in a little bit some of the different ways that you can kind of hack a search engine through really good SEO to make sure that if on the right page, for the right query for your audience, you're taking up most of the real, real estate. And what's important about SEO is you can do that and you can beat out the bigger websites by having really good structured data and having everything in place. So you don't have to be the biggest person in the race to win in this case. When we talk about content marketing and different tactics, things that you know I, I hear a lot from people is, it's just too much. I don't know how to get started. How do I keep it going? 
in general, none of you are a big publisher. You're not the BBC who's going to be putting out 100 articles a day, and you don't have to to be successful. What's important is to figure out the structure that works for you, the tactics that work for you, and to figure out just kind of a routine that you can do. So if you want to start with blogging, maybe you start with just one per week, one really good quality blog that answers one of those questions that your customers have that tells them more about that service that you know they come to you for or that expertise that you know you have that they don't. For emails, how many of you love getting lots of emails every single day? All right, your customers don't either. So you have to think about what are you giving them and you have to make sure that it's quality that they're going to actually see value. When they see your name, you want them to want to open that. either, And you can decide how you want that to be. Social media, I know a lot of us talked about posting on social media as part of our business plan. How many of you are posting once a week? Okay, that's not a problem at all. How many a couple times a week? Anybody a couple times a day? Okay. So I would say if you're just getting started out, two or three times a week is okay to get started. You don't have to be on every single platform. You're going to grow that to what you can. If you can do multiple posts a day on multiple uh, platforms, it's going to give you more data, more touch points, but you don't want to be spamming. Same with email, you don't need to spam them. Start with what works for you and what's not going to scare you off from having a good marketing plan. It's like the first thing. Just don't scare yourself. You don't need to. Um, newsletters, monthly, quarterly, you don't have to do those every single week. And anyone doing other Tactics like a hard mailing, a newsletter, um, maybe in-person events. Okay. Anyone doing industry events? Okay. When you do an industry event, do you have a plan for how you're going to follow up after with the people you meet? So whether it's an industry event or do any of you work with local business chambers? Okay, I see a couple of people. Even just going to one of those dinners, think about it like you would an industry event. What do I want, what do they care about? What do I want to tell them? How can I help them? And what do I want to do after with them? What do I want them to do after? All of this is important because all of this is how you're going to convert that person you met at a meeting into a lead. It's about thinking about what they need and how you connect. So one of those first exercises we did, their interest, your expertise, where do they overconnect? Uh, we gave a couple examples of different levels that you could do, mostly because sometimes people tell me they just want to have a template. They want to know how many words need to be in that email so that they feel more comfortable writing it. As Peter said, none of this is hard, with the exception of Twitter. Uh, some of the social medias will actually have limits. LinkedIn, 5,000. Twitter, 240 for characters. But you know, think about what you can actually keep up with. And the most important thing is good content without a CTA, without a call to action or a next step, does not convert them to your lead for you. You're doing yourself a disservice, and you're helping inform them, but they don't know where to go or what to do next. Help walk them through that path, especially if it's a topic that they're already really confused about. One of the things that I love to do, and nobody think I'm lazy, but this is my favorite way to write content, I schedule like half a day, and I say, OK, I'm going to write all about a topic. And then from that, I break it out into different blogs. I write emails to support it, social media posts to support it. This is back from the day when writing this content was just one of the many hats I was wearing and not the one I got to do all the time. And what we can do is take all of this work that Peter's shown us with the keyword research, knowing what our customers want, knowing how we can answer that need, We've put all of that in. We've written content that answers it. Once you write the content, you have to tell people it exists. You can't put it on your blog and assume it's going to show up. So put it in your email. Send it in your newsletters. When you're calling a customer, tell them about this cool blog that you just wrote. Send it to them without an ask. Just say, hey, I know that you're having trouble figuring out how to convince your finance director that you need a, a cybersecurity plan. Or you're having trouble convincing your boss that even though your uh, you know, small grocery store, cybersecurity actually is important to you. If you have a blog post that helps them answer that and tell their boss, it's perfect for them. And you're giving them help because they're already trying to battle. Think of how many times 
in whatever life you've had, you had to try to convince your boss to let you go to a conference or to buy a new software, your customers are in the same place. Make it easy for them to say yes, and you make it easy for them to say yes to you. So now that we have the content and we've shared it, make sure we're checking our metrics. So if you have a website, how many of you have some form of tracking, whether it's uh, Google Analytics or Adobe on your website? Okay. If you don't, how many of you are using maybe a platform that gives you some sort of, to build your website that maybe gives you some sort of analytics about what's happening? Okay. You want to use that data. That data is essentially free to you to help you make a business plan. So what are the pages that people are visiting the most on your website? Where do they stay the longest? If you have um, conversions or CTAs on your site, where are they converting best? This doesn't have to be really complicated. You can go in, let's use, we'll use Google Analytics for an example and we can talk about the different platforms if, if anybody wants to. Go in, take a look and see if you set up conversions. You can do it somewhat, depending on your platform, it could be easier or harder, but there's lots of consultants who can help you. You can use that data to help you figure out what more do I need to write about. Maybe you can find, with that keyword research you've done for your SEO, you can find business opportunities that you're not taking advantage of yet that you could completely own the market because nobody else is either. All of this is not just marketing research, it's business research. The two of them are very much interconnected. So if you need to convince somebody that you need a full marketing person, think of it this way. It's like sales and marketing together. It's biz dev, sales, marketing, all together. The analytics help you. Facebook, any of your social media platforms, they also offer you free analytics where you can just see who are, which posts are people clicking on the most, which ones do they like, which ones do they share. Once you know what content your audience likes, you want to create more of it. If you have a budget to do paid advertising, see which of your Facebook posts have the best engagement rate, put a little bit of money behind them and boost them to an audience that you don't already know. Help the algorithms help you reach new people. If you have that analytics on your site, you can also build remarketing lists. So if someone comes to your site, you can go touch them on other paid channels. Uh, there's cookies consent, we can talk about all of that, but let's, let's keep it easy and say everybody wants to uh, read your ads. So we'll pretend everybody wants to right now. All of that, more data for you, more ways to reach, and it helps you understand how to create new content. So then you take your best performing, you make sure you SEO optimize it again, and you just keep repeating. It's one of those, what, lather, rinse, repeat? That's the, that's the phrase. So think about this as how do I get the most out of the content that I'm already putting my investment hours into? So if it's your time, all of your time costs you money. Don't think of it just as free, think of it as time, and think about how you get the best return on the time you're putting into your marketing efforts. All right, so now we're gonna hand this over to Peter because he is our SEO expert. We're gonna talk about how do we structure that website to make sure it's really gonna be successful for driving conversions and help you hit your goals. And I just wanna point out, if your goal is branding, all of this works just the same way. So you may, instead of gating the information and putting a lead form there, you may be more focused on public videos, um, sharing the content, make, giving lots of free content, and all of that can also be tracked through whatever platform you have for your website as a conversion. It doesn't have to include email. Thank you. All right. So we talked about keyword research, we talked about content creation and how often we should share it. So now we should talk about the search intent. So understanding the user search intent is how Google actually provides the most relevant uh, result to the person who's searching for the given query. So previous example would be cybersecurity. Um, you can structure your contents website to match Google's logic and this way you're gonna be able to increase your um, search positions, not only for a single given keyword, like I mentioned earlier, but for entire topical cluster, like cybersecurity. So there's four types. We have informational. Um, this is usually the what and why. We have navigational, 
whenever you're searching for a specific brand, so maybe Nike shoes, uh, transactional, these are usually a uh, comparison type of um, uh, pieces of content where you can see uh, a single solution from different vendors and compare which one you would like better. And you have the commercial one, that usually you're ready to buy. Uh, so it's, for example, would be buy backup solution, order backup solution, uh, get backup software, something like that. So in order to be able to actually do that, first we have to learn how to analyze the search engine ranking page. Um, so on the left side, you can see on top, uh, this shouldn't be really uh, anything new. Everybody has been searching something into Google at least once, even today probably. Uh, but on top, you have your search query, which is followed by paid search ads. Now, this is not always the case. Uh, some search queries don't have paid ads. You cannot bid on them. So on the right side, you can see, for example, backup on cloud. Um, yeah, by the way, we're not bragging that Acronis is on first place or anything, but... <laughs> Uh, you can see that it doesn't have paid ads. So going back on the left side, again, feature snippet, this is also your first organic result. Keep that in mind. It's not the one that's under the people also ask box, but it's the first one which has featured snippet. Always not, it's also not gonna be always the case. Uh, right below that, you have organic search results anywhere from uh, 1 to 10 all the way to like 15 depending on the search engine ranking page. And uh, just keep in mind that the people also ask box, as we showed earlier, is actually a great place where you can find ideas for content. Um, usually whenever you click one of those questions, they keep expanding so you can easily get to like 5,000 word um, blog post. Now, um, yeah, this is probably looking a little scary, but uh, just we're, we're gonna give you some rules to live by whenever you're optimizing your content. Now, starting with number one, um, always use a pyramid structure of your content. Again, looks scary, but if you recall back to your high school or college years, you've done that whenever you were researching a thesis paper. So we have your main topic, uh, which is header one, and in a second I'll explain what that means. You have your subtopic, header two, subtopic of the subtopic, which is header three, and then you have a conclusion summary or a product solution. Make sure it's a product solution. Um, so these headers are actually HTML elements which are in the back end of the website. Uh, I would not worry about them too much because any type of CMS system which you use has actually hard-coded them. For example, WordPress, you would have uh, this pyramid structure no matter what type of a template you're using. Don't worry about it. Uh, number two, use main keyword in your header one, so in your main topic, like on the right side, we can see um, we have cyber protection services, which is our main keyword in the uh, picture, combined with the title MSP platform built to enable cyber protection services. Um, it could be managed cyber security services for small businesses. I think this would be more relevant for you. Uh, then we have the meta title and meta description. Uh, before I get into their requirements, uh, some of you might know might not know what these are. So these are the page titles and the short description that comes up into Google whenever Google actually displays your website for a certain search query. So first you see the title, then you see the so short description down below before you actually visit the page. Uh, title length should be anywhere between 30 to 60 characters. Uh, meta description length, uh, here it actually gets a little tricky, so the rule is 100 to uh, 158, but what Google is showing is always the first 920 pixels, so it might be more, it might be less, really depends on your description. Do not stuff your content uh, with keywords, as we said earlier, Google's already ranking for topical clusters. Don't spam a single keyword everywhere. It just doesn't look natural, and Google will most likely penalize you for that. Optimize for the user. Again, just mentioned that. Um, something that's really nice uh, to do on every single content piece, which you'll be awarded by Google, is providing added value. Now, whether it's going to be an FAQ uh, section, videos, or infographics, usually these are actually read by the Google bots and if they have markup data on them, Google will actually award you higher, getting those featured rich snippet results which we saw on the previous slide. 
avoid excessive internal linking. That should be simple. Um, I'm pretty sure that a lot of you have read articles where you see link on every single um, row. So it's really annoying. Don't do that. Do not dilute the traffic. Keep the person on that page. And maybe the only link you want to have is your CTA where it leads to a conversion. Don't dilute the traffic. Really important. Um, now we get to the one of the most important topics, which we've mentioned several times throughout the presentation, which is topical authority or semantic SEO. Um, so topical authority is an SEO strategy where a website becomes an authority for one or more topics. Again, they have to be related. You cannot be an expert on baking pizzas and selling sneakers. Just if you're going to do that, make sure you have two separate websites. So um, it is achieved when the website actually includes content which covers the entire topic as a whole. Um, on the right side, we can see we have cybersecurity. So the way it's spread out is you start with cybersecurity. You want to uh, talk about the where. So for example, where is it applied? Uh, who, who does it? Um, who applies cybersecurity features? Why is it important? Um, all, all these questions. And as obviously, they're branching off. So you can even end up writing a white paper, to be honest. Um, the way you do that is you research your keywords in your terms. You always start with one. We already said that. Map these keywords to your list of topics you, which you want to write about. Um, write high quality content that answers the user need questions. Always provide added value and share with your audience. Um, so I've been doing SEO for over seven years and these are definitely the most common pitfalls which I've seen. The first one is not having a clear page structure, lacking of headings, which we talked about earlier. Um, do not make everything bold, big, it's just annoying. It's, it, it doesn't look good, uh, people do not like that anymore. I know it might seem like an attention grabber, but just don't do that. Keep always the most important topics on top of your page. So a single website offering multiple services in non-related niches, already talked about that, no pizzas and sneakers on the same website, uh, content without addressing a certain keyword. While you still need to write for the user, you have to make sure that you have that initial keyword which you want to rank for within your content. It should be in your page title and it also should be in your header one or even in multiple places. But do not make it look natural. Don't stuff keywords. Um, something that's really unique for you, you need to use the word manage in conjunction with services. So for example, uh, manage backup services, manage cybersecurity services. This is going to help you a lot. These are really niche related keywords, which you can easily rank for because they're not that competitive. And if you follow everything, which we recently told you, uh, you would definitely be able to rank into the top 10. Um, we have a great landing page, but thin content. So you have all these visuals, you have videos, you have infographics, but you don't have any text. Uh, well, while that might actually seem good, some people might like that, Google is not going to be able to rank you for anything because they do not have any information of what the page is about. So make sure you always have some content in there. Um, great design or uh, and content, so we have that, but we don't have any page titles and any meta descriptions. So whenever the Google bots actually comes, they first read the page title and page description. If the bot does not know what the page is about, that's where they get their information, and then they read the content. So now that we talked about uh, everything that's really important in SEO, I'm handed off to Rita to talk about paid ads. Yeah, uh, anybody has any questions? Anything specific that they want to ask? Anything that's unclear? Yeah, go ahead. Um, where do you recommend going to kind of get started on SEO? Like, you know, just more in depth and getting more training on it and Google SEO, where would you recommend? Uh, SearchEngineJournal.com, that's definitely the best place to go to. Search Engine Journal. And yeah, um, we actually have a resource slide which you're going to be able to see. Uh, also, you have access to the presentation anyways, but yeah, definitely. Anything else? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, okay, sure. You don't want to come up? No worries.
content part, making sure that my grammar makes kind of sense when I'm trying to um, get the word out there. Um, and I, it gets corrected by coworkers and stuff, so it kind of makes my job a little bit harder. Is there any recommendation that you have for me other than word, grammar, <laughs> any tools? <laughs> Yeah, so it's a great question. I know a lot of people, when they're struggling to make sure that the wording makes sense, um, they use they do use the plugin for Grammarly, and that's one that you can get if you have Chrome. There's a plugin, and what it will do. Um, I have friends who English is their second language, and they actually use it a lot because it helps them not only make sure the grammar is correct and the spelling is correct, but sometimes even just the syntax of the sentence. So if you are using um, I'll give you an example, Word. So if you write in Word, you'll see like a little blue squiggly. And that's that will tell you if maybe you're using a passive voice and it wants you to use a more active voice. When it comes to content writing, the active voice is a really powerful tool. So that's the difference of... Um, I use this all the time, and of course I'm on stage, so I can't remember at this exact moment. But so maybe would you please stop versus stop. So it's passive, would you please, versus just the hard stop. You're thinking marketing terms. You're thinking helping people. You want to really make sure that you're giving them, you're making it easy for them, but that active voice, even something as small as that, using Word could help you find them. And then gl Grammarly is a really great tool from a spelling and a statement perspective. Sometimes it will also give you other words you may want to use at the same time, which is nice. You're welcome. I would say overall for all of you, you know, writing for marketing just as you do it, it, you'll start getting more comfortable. But if you use the language, if you repeat the language that you hear from your customers, that's how you're going to make sure you're always using their language. Um, those of you who are marketers by profession, you've probably heard you, everything you write should be at a fifth grade level to make sure that you are able to reach the majority of audiences. That includes people who English may not be their native language. Uh, you may have people who are of different levels of education. You may just have people who come from different cultures that use you know, different terms. So you, you can fall back to some of those tried and trues and go back and thank you know, some of my previous teachers for making sure they taught me that. You're welcome. So before we go into advertising, I just want to make sure. So from my perspective, I'm not an SEO. Um, by any stretch. I know enough information to be dangerous and probably give Peter a couple headaches. Oh, more than once. <laughs> uh, so I know from my perspective, when I'm writing for marketing and I'm writing for conversion, where I use a lot of these SEO terms, if I have a page that's indexed by Google, it's to help me rank higher in the search engine. It's also because the search engines care so much about the user experience now, they're actually forcing me to be a better marketing writer because I, if I want to rank well, I have to think about my user first. So we'll talk about landing pages for paid advertising, but the most important thing you can have on your site is clarity, direction. So make sure you're using really clear words and you're helping the person on your site know what to do next. If your goal is thought leadership and you want to show that your brand is knowledgeable about something, you can have lots of, you know, what is cybersecurity? What's the fastest way to do a, a pen test? Maybe you want to know uh, what are free tools that I can use for cybersecurity. Don't be afraid to tell people about free tools. Just because there's a free tool doesn't mean that it, it can do the job better than you can. Yeah, so free tools from SEO and Stanford actually are really useful because it brings in traffic to the website, grows exposure, and you can get some free links from really big websites. So this is always a plus. We're really messing with the, the audio guys going back and forth, but they're doing a great job. Thanks, guys. So before we go on from SEO and from some of the things we just talked about, any questions about how to translate all of that into lead generation, why we're doing it, why it matters? OK, everybody gets it? Great. I have a question. Please. Um, 
That's a great question. So when you get lead gen, who do you give it to? Who do you give it to right now? Well, I have an inside sales team that qualifies it, and um, they scrub it against Zoom and Phone and some other products, and then they hand it over to they hand it over to a salesperson, and then we've got a process in place. But I'm always open to hearing someone that does it better. Yeah, well, and maybe before I answer, so I've, I've worked marketing, marketing sales in a number of different companies for a while. But how many, of, just as a show of hands, how many of you take a lead and you send it to either some form of a sales team, either a BDR who's going to do some vetting, maybe there's a salesperson who's taking it? Um, okay. Maybe I should ask first, how many of you are doing lead generation? All right. Okay. So from my perspective, I would say what I do with the lead depends on what that lead is. So if I'm gating maybe a high, uh, what we'll call a high funnel, so uh, level setting on concepts of marketing. I think sales funnels are pretty well understood where somebody comes in and you're moving them to a, a point of sale. A marketing funnel, people have different opinions. I think of it as an hourglass where there's people who are new to your system and then you're teaching them and getting them to convert, and then it can't stop there, right? There's too much competition. You have to continue to nurture them to move them back through. So I actually think of it as more of an hourglass. Just because they're in doesn't mean I'm done talking to them. Um, maybe I'm just sending them, in, I subscribe them to a newsletter just for information, and I know that they're interested in cybersecurity, so once a month I send them a cool newsletter about the biggest threats that have happened recently. Um, maybe I have a customer retention tool where I print out from Acronis, you know, these are the number of penetrations or these are the number of attacks we thwarted this week or this month so that they actually know that what I'm doing for them is working. Because it's working because they don't remember they have it, right? So in my sense, I'm Acronis. That's, you know, where I'm probably going to come from. But to answer your question, it's going to depend on what the type of lead is. If I have multiple ways that they can convert, if they're higher funnel, I want to warm them and I want them to appreciate getting my brand before I have someone necessarily calling them all the time. But if it's a try now, if it's a get a quote, if it's a how do I compare against my competitors, I want to make sure that I'm getting them to somebody who can help them understand why I'm the right fit. Does that help answer? Did that answer your question? OK. Did I leave anything? OK, great. I ask a lot of questions, which is probably why I'm a marketer. <laughs> um, so anything else? Let me just go back. And I know we're coming tight on time, so I don't want to go too far back. Uh, meta title, meta description. So I come from a world of social media. The reason that having this back end code was really important to me is because once upon a time, the social media platforms let me edit the description and the preview that happened when somebody shared my website on their Facebook page, for example. And they don't do that anymore for a number of different reasons, um, mostly tied to, we won't, yeah, we won't go into it. Uh, but they won't do it anymore. So that meta title and that meta description, if somebody shares your blog post, you want to control the message and make sure it's really well optimized to make them want to click for you. So even from a paid perspective or just a social media perspective, these are important. They're telling the search engines what your page is about. They're telling the users what your page is about, and it's a good little opportunity to convince them to come visit your site. All right. So digital advertising, why do I harp on SEO? Because if you're going to spend the money to send somebody to a site, you want it to do what you want it to do, right? So don't waste money by sending them to a user to a page where they don't know very clearly what action to take or where it's not connected to the thing that they asked about. So if they have a search query for cybersecurity and you have a beautiful ad, beautiful ad copy, beautiful banner, whichever way you want it to go, and they land on a page that's about something else, they're going to bounce off. And when they bounce off, they're telling the search engine that this isn't a good match. So they're telling the search engine that these people need to bid higher to be able to get that, that search term. They need to work harder to get the traffic than somebody who has a really clear user path. So even just if you think about your dollars and cents, 
SEO from a paid perspective, very important. And we can think about that everything from the banner ad that you're using. Uh, what imagery, does it match what's on the landing page? Does the ad copy give them a really clear what's in it for them or what they can expect? And does that match what they get to the page? And does that match if they fill out a lead form and get a white paper from you? Are they getting the white paper they thought they were going to get when they first saw that ad? All of that's very important. It all comes down to user experience, whether it's content marketing, digital marketing, email, all of it. You know, there's too many choices out there for people. You want to make it really easy for them to say yes to you. You want it to be really easy for them to decide and tell you that they're the right customer. So when we think about our landing pages, not only is it that really clear connection, but we want to think about what else landing pages can tell us. We talked a little bit about uh, tracking sites, whether you use Adobe, um, Google Analytics. Having conversion tracking on your site to understand how people use your page is critical because, and let me, let me just stop. You can have a website without tracking. It's OK. It's fine. No one's doing it wrong if you don't have tracking on your page. Um, but you can help yourself by putting the tracking on your page. And a lot of the platforms that you may be using to build your website, or a lot of the teams that you may be engaging to build your website, can put this tracking on for you. And if they can't, there are agencies and consultants out there that can help. What it can let you know is what, how many pages people have visited, which pages. Maybe you tag very important pages so that you know that that's the audience you want to call from. Maybe you know that if there's a lead form on one of those pages, that that is a low funnel lead for you, and definitely you want the sales team to call. Whereas other ones, maybe that just drops them into a nice email nurturing. So you're really customizing the experience for the user without having to do a lot of effort on your side because you can kind of set those up on the back end. We want to make sure there's a really easy call to action. Don't make it hard for anyone to say yes to you but you know that you're asking them for their contact information. So how many of you have a, I'll throw this, how many of you have a junk email that you use to fill out forms for things that you want the assets, but you don't want to talk to those people again? I, know I, do. <laughs> I have at least one of them. If you're gonna ask someone for their information, make it worth their while. So don't confuse them, don't try to play the games, help them help you organize your sales efforts. It's again about your time, right? You don't want to be chasing down leads that aren't going to be good for you. And you don't want to be putting in effort to build really good content and really good assets to not have them a place where they can tell you, yes, I want you. You and I are a good match. It's half the work for you just in letting them self-select in that way. Then when we think about it, we want to have those clear call to actions. We'll talk a little bit later, we've actually broken down based off the level, um, let's put it the, the stage of where they are. Are they decision? Are they actually trying to choose? We've broken down some of the CTAs and types of assets you might want to use. And you guys can take pictures of any of these and we'll, we'll get you what we can here. And we talked already about the ad copy, so I'm not going to go too far into it, but all of this is before we even start our advertising, before you start deciding you're going to spend your dollars. Just a quick recap, so Peter's already gone through search. So we have different types of search results. We have paid placements, we have organic placements. One of the things that Peter showed you was the people also ask, the structured snippets, all of those different ways that you can show up organically. You can show up organically for all of those because you have really good SEO structure. You don't have to pay for those. There, you can see some small sites that will be in the people also ask because they have such a good connection. They beat out all the big players by just having really good structure because someone else was too lazy to put it through. So there's, there's opportunity for you there and there are agencies that can help you. You do not have to do this all on your own. You can choose to, but you don't have to. Uh, Facebook social media platforms, tons of them there. YouTube video is one of the big, the big ways that content's being engaged right now. Is anyone using video, live, recorded, whichever format right now? OK. Those of you that aren't, any particular reason? It doesn't seem like a lot of work. Feels like a lot of work. Yes, I'm with you. Yeah, I'm with you. It feels like a lot of work. There are a lot of really great tools out there to make it a little bit easier. And uh, 
the advantage right now is there's also a lot of great consultants out there who might be willing to do an engagement. And you don't have to have someone in your backyard. So you can find, you might be able to find a partner who's the right fit for you, who works on a different time zone, and it may even make it easier because you can shoot one day and they can edit overnight for you. So there's a lot of ways to go about it. But if you want to get started with video, I would say, you know, go ahead and start by um, interviewing a couple of your technicians or take some of those most commonly asked questions and just put up your webcam, have a nice background so everything looks nice. Don't put anything you don't want somebody to see in the background, please. Please? Okay. And answer some of the top questions that you get from customers. I see a lot of people do this in short form. And they'll do it uh, as simple as, hey, you know, today I was at a client and they asked me how come this, this, and this. And you know what? I hear this all the time. So let me set the record straight right here. Here's how you can do it. It could be a five-minute video. It could be a three-minute video. You don't have to worry about putting too much of the pressure with the editing. Um, you know, just as a way to get started, even if you just do it for fun. Yeah, please. So when you're posting the video on YouTube, or are you posting it on your site? Where so it's a great question. Where do you post the video? Yeah. So there's a couple different ways you can do it. You can, you can have a YouTube account and post it on YouTube and then embed it in your site. One of the reasons that there's an advantage there is because then the, all the analytics go through YouTube. So, and YouTube connects to Google Ads. So your for all of your remarketing efforts, you can actually build remarketing audiences off of people based off the videos they viewed. You can put it right on Facebook. You can put it on all the social media platforms. Yeah. And then from an SEO standpoint. Yeah, so from an SEO standpoint, you actually want to embed it on your page um, as well, not only just YouTube. Because for the simple reason that um, there has been a lot of cases where, at least for Acronis, a lot of our keywords actually have video snippets. So whenever you search for, let's say, backup solution, you have a video snippet down on the search engine ranking page. Now, not only you will get your page showing in the search results, but you also get the video snippet, which what does that mean? You actually take up more space from that search engine ranking page. You push down your competitors, it's a win. So. Is YouTube still the second yeah. largest search engine? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. YouTube still, no, 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 third, uh, TikTok. Uh, TikTok. <laughs> I, I'm not going to talk about it. Anybody using TikTok? No? Okay. Ah. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> I can't tell you how many hours get lost in my house, not professionally on TikTok. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so there's lots of different ways that, and reasons that you can use video. I will tell you if you were to talk to any of the major social media platforms about advertising and what content they want you to do, they're going to tell you video because that's where they're getting most of their people to stay. It's, um, we joke about TikTok, but there's a reason why hours pass, because as you go through, it's very, you know, it's, I guess, soothing. Soothing for people to kind of go through some of it. We'll use a positive term. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about setting your budget, right? So I'm here talking to you about paid advertising, talking about content. I understand not everybody's got a budget for this. So we're gonna break things down a couple different ways. Let's say that you have less than $500 a month. Yes, you can actually do this on less than $500 a month. There's different ways. I would tell you if you have less than $500 a month, and there'll be a slide with all of them that might um, be helpful too. Think about your organic presence, your SEO, because that's really the basis for a lot of what you're doing. Um, if we haven't stressed that enough, SEO is the basis for everything that you're doing with the website. Uh, but there's SEO structures across the board. It's not just on your website. If you were publishing an article in an industry publication, when I do those, when I uh, write articles for dark reading or something like that, I've got my friend Peter who reads everything and makes sure that from an SEO perspective, there's a good thought leadership with the right connection back to my site to help benefit me. So these don't just work on your own site. They're, they're all the tactics that you're using. But with less than $500 a month, I'm going to focus on my organic presence. I'm going to work on SEO. I'm going to work on my social media and community work. So if I have a social media profile, I'm going to make sure that I'm spending some time there, building a relationship, building a basis, even if I'm not running ads. I'm going to work on email. I'm going to work on 
If I have a little bit of money, maybe I'm gonna boost some of those best performing social media posts to help reach a larger audience. And that means putting a couple dollars behind it and I get to target which audience I wanna reach. If you have questions about that, I, I could talk for weeks on it so we can, we can chat after. If I have $500 to $1,000 a month, I'm gonna add on to building my organic work. And one thing I wanna tell you with website and SEO, we have it under low cost. It really depends. Do you wanna put your time into it or do you wanna put the investment up front into it and have maybe an agency or person come? You can get the same results. It's just really gonna be, you have to kind of balance those two. Um, for $2,000 to $5,000 a month, pretty good budget. Here, I'm gonna start expanding. So I, at 500 to 1,000, maybe I was doing some of those remarketing audiences. Maybe I was starting to think about bidding on my own brand name. At 2,000 to $5,000 a month, I definitely wanna make sure I have branded paid search going. And a lot of people ask me, why am I gonna bid on my own brand? There may be a few reasons you choose to bid on your own brand. One of them could be a really competitive market. Maybe you're in one town and there's two of you there and you wanna make sure that you're the one that they see first. Maybe you haven't quite gotten your SEO set up to own that whole first page yet, so you wanna make sure you show above your competitors. You don't always have to be in point one. Uh, maybe your competitors are bidding on your terms already. The way I would check that, do a little Google search. Google your name and see if anybody else is advertising. It's not against the rules for them to bid on your brand. It is against trademark rules without your permission for them to be using your brand name and saying something like, best alternative to company Z. So we've got the 2,000 to 5,000. Um, here I'm saying let's start talking about non-brand paid search. So if your company offers cybersecurity, we'll stick with the IT Irene example, your non-brand terms could be cybersecurity for SMB or cybersecurity providers. Some of those terms are ones you may use. They can get really expensive, so we're gonna talk about a couple ways to check that. And then if you get to the point that you can reinvest revenue into marketing, this is an ideal place to be. I would say think about 10, 15% of your revenue. And then there we're doing the non-brand paid search. We're making, we're maybe expanding into display advertising, which are those nice banners that are beautiful and pretty and you're gonna start seeing a whole bunch of them for Black Friday sales if you haven't already. And then you can expand your social media advertising. There's a lot of good demographic information there that if you can find the right mix, you can use. Before I go on to the next page, knowing we're a little tight on time um, and giving you time to take pictures, any questions on setting your budget, paid advertising? Okay. Optimizing paid campaigns. For those of you who are doing paid campaigns, here's the big themes. Are you reaching the right people? with the right message, and what is happening with your ads that you may not have intended. So when you're doing paid search, check the lists of the search terms that your ad's showing for. Which of them do not make sense for your business? If you have, if you're trying to get cybersecurity solutions and they say, you know, who's the biggest cyber attacker or something and that's not what you want, just, you can set that to a negative. There are different match types. They will mix to different ways. Uh, make sure you're breaking out keywords, ad groups. Think of it this way. Who are your audiences? What are their closest connections to each other? And then group them the same way you grouped your content. That way you could speak to the audience, you could speak to the content, and you can make a really clean, easy path for the user. Uh, we talked about updating landing pages, making sure those are SEO optimized but also say when you run your ad campaigns, and you can start doing this earlier than you might think, look to see which pieces of content or creative do really well, meaning like what has a higher click-through rate, what has a better conversion rate, and what is not doing as well. So your lower engagement rates, your lower CTRs, and then start turning off low performers and duplicating and slightly editing top performers. This is how you easily optimize you take the learning that's in the platform. You don't have to reinvent. I promise we do CTAs by different audience standards. So this uh, might be a good one to take. Basically, if someone is just talking about your industry, they're talking about your topic, their engagement, their discovery, maybe it's just fun for them. Give them video content where they can learn more. 
give them an article or a blog, make it not, not super high ask for them. But these are also not the leads you're going to give to your sales team, which is why you may decide you're not going to gate it. You may say, I'm going to run this website, this video on my website and on my YouTube, and then if people watch it, then I will go back and remarket to them with something in the education or the research space. So you can actually kind of look at your resources in that way. Uh, when they get to justification, so if they're looking at you against, you know, they're trying to decide this is definitely a service I need, you want to give them something else. You want to give them maybe a chance for a free trial consultation. You want to give them a case study or an explanation of how you beat the competitors that they may be looking at you for. And then as they're trying to purchase, you want to give them content that helps them justify to the people they need to speak with, whether it's themselves and their own budget, whether it's their finance team, they need to justify why they should say yes to you. Everything is about helping make it easy for them to say yes to you. And then of course, buy now, sign up, call. And then a couple big budget drainers. So really here are the themes. There are different forms of keywords that you can use if you've gone to paid search. There are different, what they're called is match types. And there's an image on the screen that will show you as you narrow how that helps to tie in. But basically a broad match is gonna to match to any of those terms. So you could have something completely unrelated to what you do. If you're gonna start with paid advertising, start all the way down in the exact. And you do that with brackets. The search has to match exactly what you've put in for you to spend money on that search. Start here and then build out. It will save you a lot of money. Uh, I've seen people burn money really fast right away. Start small, start tight, and then build out as you learn. The other thing is if you're not targeting the right people, if you only have a demographic area of 60 miles, you don't want to advertise outside that 60 miles. If you, your business closes at five and there's no one there to answer the phone, you don't want to run a call me now ad at eight. So it, it seems really simple, but these are settings you can do in the platforms that I've seen people, they just, they miss them and they spend a lot of money before they figure it out. So start tight, know who your audience is and then build out as you go. And then we have a couple additional tools. So I'll invite Peter to come up. No, no, I gave you a heads up. All right, so we're, we're going to start with the writing prompts. I get a lot of people who say, I don't know how to write. I don't know what to write. So here's a couple examples of things that you can use to build content and some of the different platforms you may want to run it on. They're the same things we've been talking about. You've used all of your great search term, keyword research, to come up with a list. You have what the people also ask you know what's happening in the news. So if you're selling cybersecurity and there's a big company breach, you know, you, you can put that up. Well, we could talk about scare tactics and what's, you know, how you approach it and all that, but inform your customers about this is happening in the space. You don't have to scare them, but you want them to understand why it's important. Look at the top questions that your sales team gets asked. My favorite one, Ask your sales team or yourself if you're the one selling, what are the most common hurdles that cause you to lose a sale? What are the things that people just can't get past? And it's usually something that you can solve for. So maybe they say, I can't justify cybersecurity prevention tactics because I'm a small shop who wants to attack me. You want to give them tools and information that's going to help level that hurdle or at least bring it down so that you're not fighting all the time for it. And you can do that before they're even ready for the sales process, when you're still advocating for the topic itself. Uh, customer interviews are another one I love, or tech interviews, where you, you can use this as a, a great video one to do where it doesn't have to be super formal. And you can kind of ask a customer, why do they work with you? What are the things that they worry about? Or if you know that there's a topic that a lot of your customers care about, ask them to talk about how that's, a, how that's an issue for them or how they've overcome it. Even if it's not because of you, you're giving a voice to your customer and you're helping to attract people who look like them. So I would suggest doing that with your best customers, the ones you want to replicate and you want to build a business around. Uh, those are the types of things that will help you, identifying those will help you to identify how you want to approach things. And then for tools, 
cut it over? Yeah, so I'm not gonna take too much time. I'll just give you some, some of my favorites. Um, so we have SEM Rush and Ahrefs. Uh, what these are, they're first, they're paid, but they have different tiers of payment. Um, for, for unless you're a cor corporation, they're gonna be really, really expensive for a corp. But if you're a small business, they, they don't get really that expensive. What they are is usually they offer all-in-one solutions for SEO. Uh, I'll just use SEMrush for example. You can do a do domain level overview of your entire website, gives you keywords. Uh, you can do a gap analysis uh, with your competitors just to see some of the keywords that they're using that you might not be using. You can see which pages are ranking there. You can even have a backlink profile, which Ahrefs is actually much, much better just to analyze who's linking to your website and what kind of links you're getting. I'm not gonna go too much in depth into that, into that but my favorite one, uh, my most, most favorite one is actually also asked, which you've seen several times through the presentation. It's that tool with the pictures where they give you a topical map. Um, this is so easy and it's really, really cheap. I believe it was something like $15 a month. Uh, you just feed it in a keyword, and instead of clicking through those PAA boxes into Google, you actually save so much time because it gives you the structure of your main topic and what's followed by, so you can just start writing right away just following those questions. Um, some places where you can uh, get some really good SEO information are Search Engine Land and Search Engine Journal. Um, recently, Search Engine Journal actually can get really technical, but it has from really basic to really complex stuff. It's a really good place, however, to follow on Google Core algorithm updates. Um, recently, for the past two months, we had like four, three, four. Um, so if you're seeing some drop in traffic, you can always find out why on that website. And for social and paid, that you could use uh, the learning publishers I think this is a great one just keep a keep a note on these uh, marketing land search engine land they're siblings so sometimes you'll see some of their articles in the other publication there's tons of stuff out there there are lots of bloggers who do this professionally it, it could be a rabbit hole um, is there anyone here just a quick chest anyone here who is from outside the Americas okay so there may be a couple, you may find a couple localized versions of these too. I, they're generally really good about overall global approaches. And then reporting, of course, we've talked about some of the different ways you can do it. You can do it all in Excel. I, my sister works in data analytics and she works in Excel all the time, pulling Python, so. Quick question, sorry. Um, I think it works. I, I've used it uh, ages ago, uh, but it, it, it's still really relevant and it's really good for uh, analytics stuff to see where like traffic comes from, um, amount of users, bounce rate, so like Google Analytics. Still really good, really good. And I know that we're, we're at time now, so we'll come off the stage, but we'll hang around if anybody has specific questions that you want to talk about. I hope you found this helpful. I think we both... We had a lot of fun putting it together. Um, we managed to take like an entire semester's course and try to do it in an hour. Yeah, I wish we had like five more hours. But <laughs> <laughs> so um, happy to talk. This is what we do all day, every day for our business. So we enjoy it a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Don't do that. Don't, Don't mix and match. These are two separate niches. Um, I've noticed it. Do you want to go on stage? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll go on stage. So, uh, to be honest, um, I actually looked a lot of the partners' uh, websites in order to get some good um, idea and make sure that everything's relevant for you. I noticed a lot of partners were actually offering that together with um, like managed digital services. Don't do that. That's not a good idea because um, if if you're telling, you want to tell Google that you're an expert in a certain field, for example, it could be cybersecurity, but you can offer endpoint security, network security, and so on, you get the point. 
but do not do not do that. Just don't offer uh, digital marketing services. If you want to do that, however, do it on a separate website or from a different profile if you're using social media. Just make sure they're not connected to each other. So I think that that's the big thing. It, it, if you're looking at from your website and from your accounts running advertising for those brands, you have to align the accounts to a domain. So you can op if you're really going to run it for them, you can open accounts for themselves or have them add you as like an agency. So it's still on an account that has their name and is linked to their domain. We can, we can talk about it a lot because I know a lot of people are doing uh, marketing funds. They're doing marketing work for their clients because their clients can't, right? It's another managed service that they can add on. So happy to talk about it after. I would like that. Yeah. Some of them are charging a lot. Yeah. 20000 a month. Yeah. I mean, they're little agencies in themselves. Yeah. So a lot, the, we do have some some MSPs that have chosen to kind of create almost this little marketing agency within themselves for their, their clients. Lots of different ways you can go about it. I have a quick question. Please. Thank you for uh, so we're a small, pretty small MSP. And um, in terms of content marketing, is it blog, email, social media, and newsletters? Is there one that we should prioritize? So in terms of content marketing, there are thousands of different ways that you could do it. What I would ask in how do I decide which tactic to use first is to think about what my goals are. So if I'm trying to bring people in, a blog can be a relatively easy way to do that. But I spoke with an MSP, and if you're here, just wave at me, uh, an MSP who's actually taking all the blogs and then once a quarter makes a hard physical newsletter that they drop off to related businesses. And for them, that is one of their best lead acquisitions. It takes kind of like the old school newsletter. But we were talking about this earlier. All the marketing tactics change, but the structure and what you're really doing is the same. So the ultimate goal and kind of the approach that you're taking, it may evolve, but content marketing has always been around. We just didn't name it that way. And it's if you're really thinking user first, it's, an, it's a tried and true marketing approach. Um, for you on which tactic to use, we can talk about it. I would say it depends on what your bandwidth is. And the first place I would look is where do I already have an audience? So do I already have people coming to my website? OK, so maybe I focus there. Do I have people actually they're all on LinkedIn? Then maybe I'm doing long form content on LinkedIn and I'm not worrying about bringing it to my website unless I know it performs really well. If you if you try to do everything and you overwhelm yourself, you'll stop doing it all. So I think it's really start small and kind of expand out as you can. You're welcome. Any other questions? OK, we'll be over here. So if you think of them or you don't want to answer them to the whole group, we're happy to talk about it. The worksheet that you have, um, feel free to take it. The other thing when you're trying to think of these tactics is remember that the Acronis Partner Portal has uh, social media drips and email drips on it already that you can customize with your brand and logo and that you can send out to your customers. We did the work for you, so I've written some of them, uh, which is why I give it a little shout out. But it's a tool that you already have. You don't have to put the effort in and then see what works for you and kind of go from there. Really yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you.